Hello, everybody. Happy New Year to all of you. I'm Mindy Mandel. I'm here with Jacob and Jed, and we are back for another year of the Republic. We just may very well be reading this all year long. It's a very long, long book. But now we are on book three, and we wrapped up music at the end of last year, the study of music. And you may recall, let me pull this up. You may recall that it ended with saying that the end and consummation of culture or music, it's actually music in Greek, the end and consummation of music is the love of the beautiful. And we tied that into the um, spiritual idea of beautiful, the higher sense of beauty. And then from today, then we're going on with a study that he calls gymnastics. But just as we saw with music, where um, it's not our common notions of music. We saw it's actually the study of states of mind. Here with the idea of gymnastics, we want to again keep in the back of our minds the idea that there's probably something else going on and we want to be thinking about that. Now, when we read music, we saw that the first few sections were very difficult to talk about because we didn't really understand what music was and we were trying to piece it together. We're going to see the same thing going on here with gymnastics. So there may not be a whole lot of discussion. These first few sections, just maybe I'll point out some sentences to hold on to. We'll look at what is what stands out to us. Okay, I'll ask you guys also what stands out to you, and I'll point out some things as well. But we'll maybe hold off on discussing gymnastics in more detail until we figure out what it is. So we got to get a few sections under our belts. Okay, well, any um, any thoughts or comments before we get started? Are ready to just jump right into the text? Okay, then we'll jump right in. So do we want to keep the same roles? Jacob, you okay to keep going on sure. with Socrates? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, After so music. Right. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. After music, our youth are to be educated by gymnastics? Certainly. In this, too, they must be carefully trained from boyhood through life. And the way of it is this, I believe. But consider it yourself, too. For I, for my part, do not believe that a sound body by its excellence makes the soul good but on the contrary that a good soul by its virtue renders the body the best that is possible. What is your opinion? I think so too. Then, if we should sufficiently train the mind and turn over to it the minutia of the care of the body, and content ourselves with merely indicating the norms or patterns, not to make a long story of it, we should be acting rightly. By all means. For intoxication, we said that they must abstain. For a guardian is surely the last person in the world to whom it is allowable to get drunk and not know where on earth he is. Yes, it would be absurd that a guardian should need a guard. What next about their food? These men are... Is this a quote? I think it... Oh, we can skip. Okay. <laughs> These men are athletes in the greatest of contests, are they not? Yes. Is then the bodily habit of the athletes we see about us suitable for such? Perhaps. Nay. That is a drowsy habit and precarious for health. Don't you observe that they sleep away their lives, and that if they depart ever so little from their prescribed regimen, these athletes are liable to great and violent diseases? I do. Then, we need some more ingenious form of training for our athletes of war. Since these must be, as it were, sleepless hounds, 
and have the keenest possible perceptions of sight and hearing, and in their campaigns undergo many changes in their drinking water, their food, and in exposure to the heat of the sun and to storms, without disturbance of their health. I think so. Would not, then, the best gymnastics be akin to the music that we were just now describing? What do you mean? It would be a simple and flexible gymnastic, and especially so in the training for war. In what way? One could learn that, even from Homer, for you are aware that in the banqueting of the heroes on campaign, he does not feast them on fish, though they are at the seaside of the Hellene's Pond, nor on boiled meat, but only on roast, which is what soldiers could most easily procure. For everywhere, one may say, it is of easier provision to use the bare fire than to convey pots and pans along. Indeed it is. Neither, as I believe, does Homer ever make mention of sweetmeats. Is not that something which all men in training understand, that if one is to keep his body in good condition, he must abstain from such things altogether? They are right. In that, they know it and do abstain from sweetmeats. Hmm. Then, my friend, if you think this is the right way, you apparently do not approve of Syracusian table and Sicilian variety of made dishes. I think not. You would frown, then, on a little Cornithian made as the charmy <laughs> charim me of men who were to keep themselves fit? I would frown about it and frown in saying it, most certainly. Certainly. Uh, also, and also on the seeming delights of attic pastry? Inevitably. In general, I take it, if we likened that kind of food and regimen to music and song expressed in the panharmonic mode, and in every variety of rhythm, it would be a fair comparison. Quite so. And there are variety engendered licentiousnesses, or licentiousness, I did it not? There are variety engendered licentiousness. Right. Did it not but hear disease? While simplicity in music begets sobriety in the souls, and in gymnastic training it begets health in bodies. Most true. And when licentiousness and disease multiply in a city, are not many courts of law and dispensaries opened, and the arts of chicane and medicine give themselves airs when even free men in great numbers take them very seriously? How can they help it? Okay, and that's the end of the section. Okay, going back to the beginning then, we want to see what kind of clues were given to give us a sense of what he means by gymnastics. Okay, going back to the beginning of the section then, and this is page 265. And by the way, this is 403C, I believe, for those following in a different text. He says here early on that, I, for my part, do not believe that a sound body by its excellence makes the soul good. Let me just highlight this section. Hold on a second. Okay, yeah. I, for my part, do not believe that a sound body by its excellence makes the soul good. 
but on the contrary that a good soul by its virtue renders the body the best that is possible. Okay, so what's the focus here? Even for gymnastics. Is it the body or the soul? Sorry. Soul. Soul, right. So we see that he's not looking to exercise just for its own sake, for the sake of the body. So in some way or another, we're looking at gymnastics somehow contributing to the health of the soul. Okay, we're not yet sure how it's going to happen, though. Um, before I ask any more questions, I wonder what stood out for you as you were reading through this. Jacob, I'll start with you. What stood out to you? Well, it seemed to indicate that gymnastics was less important than music and that uh i thought that bit about not Mm -hmm. carrying around the uh, pots and pans Mm -hmm. was interesting you know a way to say like don't you know live within your means don't carry around additional baggage Mm -hmm. okay Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah and keeping things very simple right yeah. That's mostly what stood out to me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, on page 267, he points out the best gymnastics. What does he say about the best gymnastics, either of you? Akin to the music we just mm-hmm. described. So I think when he mm-hmm. says it's like the music, is he. Because when we discussed music, we had said there was the two modes that we need mm-hmm. are the ones that make you like brave in mm-hmm. warfare mm-hmm. and the ones that are, you know, it, for peacetime, accepting mm-hmm. that like studentship or teaching uh, mm-hmm. role without mm-hmm. arrogance and stuff. Mm-hmm. You think he's talking about both of them or mostly the the warfare kind in this? Well, that's a question to hold on to. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, but in some way it is akin to music and it should be simple. And uh, yeah, that was good to point out there that, um, where was it? Page 269. He brought in the idea of panharmonic mode. It's... uh, My highlighter is not going well here for me, but it's a little further down the page. He talked about the panharmonic mode, and I will highlight it the best I can. It's a little more than halfway down the page. That word panharmonic was actually also in the section on music. You may recall when he talked about comparing the instruments of Apollo to those of Marcius and saying that the simpler instruments of Apollo were better. And so the same idea is brought in here. In general, I take it if we liken that kind of food and regimen to music and song expressed in the panharmonic mode and in every variety of rhythm, it would be a fair comparison. So he's comparing the two. And he's saying that in music, variety engendered licentiousness. But here in gymnastics, variety then would engender disease. And he says that simplicity in music, so that's what happens when you have the variety, when you have the simplicity, the benefit in music is that it begets sobriety in the soul. And I believe um, that's sophrosun, actually, sophrosun in the soul. And in gymnastics, when you have that simplicity, it brings you health in bodies. Okay, so at this point, he's still calling gymnastics something for the body, but we're going to see that's going to tweak a bit as we go on. But at this point, it sounds like music is for the soul and gymnastics for the body. At least that's the way it feels in this first section. And so I think that's why Jacob said that it seems like music is rated higher. Okay, we're going to see how he tweaks that as we go on. But at this point, it certainly seems that way. And then at the end here, the arts of 
chicane, which is like um, deception. Um, so the art of de deception and medicine, we're going to see how he uses those words as we go on. Um, when you have disease, you need more doctors and medicine, right? So we're going to see how he uses that imagery and we end up with those problems. Jed, you've been a bit quiet here. Anything you were thinking about that you want to bring the the little Corinthian made as the Sierra Mary. What does that mean? Oh, you're going to have to look that one up or uh, <laughs> use your imagination. <laughs> Who were to keep themselves fit. Oh, okay. Maybe something but, but sultry. What are you saying, Jacob? Indulgent or something like that. Like, mm. uh, Right, a certain activity that can keep people fit. Yeah. Um, all right, that's not a good one. Um, yeah, I found it interesting. Um, simple and flexible. Uh -huh. um, I like that, which really reminds me of how we described the food of um, the people living in the city of pigs. Mm. Pig city. Um and yeah, the panharmonic is the one is the instrument that can change keys or change modes within the key. So we don't want to change the mode, just like in music. Mm -hmm. uh, that was interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, going back to simple and flexible, we saw that before that he was complaining that the way that gymnastics is done now is they cannot depart from their regimen. He says just above that, that if they depart ever so little from their prescribed regimen, these athletes are liable to great and violent diseases. So they need a certain flexibility. And we saw that also in music, that the ideal is to be spontaneous, that it cannot be imitated because the person who has truly mastered music is not imitating anyone else. They're just acting spontaneously. So that, that would give them, and they're always there. And there was also the idea of appropriateness. I know it's, it's been a couple of weeks since we looked at that, but remember the idea of appropriateness was there as well with the rhythm. And so the idea that if you're acting spontaneously and your behavior is always appropriate to the situation, that would be like, that's part of the ideal there, that I, that image of the ideal. And so the idea of simple and flexible fits very nicely with that as well. Yeah, and you see that a lot with professional athletes like Zion Williamson, for example. Uh, he strays a little bit from his regimen and all of a sudden he has he's overweight, he has injuries, all the ones that retire and they lose their regiment and all of a sudden their health goes bad. But then you have the, the remarkable few who don't seem to follow any regiment and uh, Clyde Drexler comes to mind and are fantastic and spontaneous and appropriate in any situation. They, you know, show up when they want to and they, they do exactly what is needed. So you do see those two kinds in the metaphor of gymnastics in sports and athletes. Mm, okay, good. Yeah. And so we'll see how that, what is the analogy or what is that analogous to in the soul and seeing how he uses in, uh, gymnastics here. And so let's go on then to the next section, see what he adds to it. So this is uh, page 271. And uh, for those of you in a different text, I should tell you, Yes, the funnest number is 405A. Will you be able to find a surer proof of an evil and shameful state of education in a city than the necessity of first-rate physicians and judges, not only for the base and mechanical but for those who claim to have been bred in the fashion of free men? Do you not think it disgraceful and notable mark of bad breeding to have to make use of a justice imported from others who thus become your masters and judges from lack of such qualities in yourself? 
the most shameful thing in the world. Is it? Or is this still more shameful when a man not only wears out the better part of his days in the courts of law as defendant or accuser, but from the lack of all true sense of values is led to plume himself on this very thing as being a smart fellow to put over an unjust act, an unjust act and cunningly to try every dodge and practice, every evasion, and wriggle out of every hold in defeating justice, and that, too, for trifles and worthless things, because he does not know how much nobler and better it is to arrange his life so as to have no need of nodding jurymen. That is, still more shameful than the other. And to require medicine, not merely for wounds or the incidence of some seasonal maladies, but because of sloth and such a regimen as we described, to fill one's body up with winds and humors like a march and compel the ingenious sons of Asclepius to invent for diseases such names as fluxes and flatulences. Don't you think that disgraceful? Those surely are newfangled and monstrous strange names of diseases. There was nothing of the kind, I fancy, in the days of Asclepius. I infer this from the fact that at Troy his sons did not find fault with the damsel who gave to the wounded Eurypteleus to drink a posset of Pramnian wine plentifully sprinkled with barley and gratings of cheese, inflammatory ingredients of a sutri, sutri. nor did they censor P Patroclus, who was in charge of the case. It was indeed a strange potion for a man in that condition. Not so strange if you reflect that the former Asclepids made no use of our modern coddling medication of diseases before the time of Herodicus. But Herodicus was a trainer and became a valetudinarian. <laughs> valetudinarian. Hypochondriac. Hmm. Valetudinarian. And blended gymnastics and medicine for the torment first and chiefly of himself and then of many successors. How so? By lingering out his death, for living in perpetual observance of his malady, which was incurable, he was not able to effect a cure but lived through his days unfit for the business of life, suffering the tortures of the damned if he departed a wit from his fixed regimen, and struggling against death by reason of his science, he won the prize of a dotting old age. A noble prize indeed for his science. The appropriate one for a man who did not know that it was not from ignorance or in acquaintance with this type of medicine that Asclepius did not discover it to his descendants, but because he knew that for all well-governed peoples there is a work assigned to each man in the city which he must perform. And no one has leisure to be sick and doctor himself all his days. And this we absurdly enough perceive in the case of a craftsman, 
but don't see in the case of the rich and so-called fortunate. How so? Okay, the next section then goes on with the story. But before we go there, there's a lot that's very confusing here. Right from the very beginning. Will you be able to find a sure proof of an evil and shameful state of education? Now, many people say that, um, that America's education system has just gone to rot. And we know we have a bad education system because we have first-rate physicians and judges. That's the surest sign that your educational system is in a shameful state. Does that make any sense at all? No. <laughs> I think that would be the opposite. But Right. Yeah, that's what we would imagine. So we know something's going on here. We got to figure out what he means by first-rate physicians and what he means by judges. So first he starts off looking at judges. A justice imported from others. So that's so these are things to think about here that he talks about justice imported from others. Further down he talks about a nodding juryman. And this highlighter is not working well, but a nodding juryman. Because you want to also think about what that might mean. And then he goes on to talking about medicine. That's the next section here. Wounds and seasonal maladies. These all have their analog in the soul. So as we once we put it all together, we can come back and think more about what these things are. Um, now he mentioned um, what is it on page? Yeah, on this page here, he mentioned that um, Herodicus. Here he is. Herodicus was a trainer, and he was something of a hypochondriac. What was wrong with Herodicus? What did he do that was wrong? Spent his life, like, trying to, you know, uh, I guess, baby himself through this, this okay. uh, mm. disease. What's wrong with that? Unfit <laughs> for the life of a craftsman or someone mm. who's contributing to society. Mm. Because then he's right. contributing to himself, not to society, right. I guess. Mm. Right. And we have at the bottom of the page here and going on to the next page, we have again that idea that he could not depart from his fixed regimen. And he put all of his attention then on the body, constantly trying to cure himself. And he won the prize of a doting old age. So many people would say he was successful. He lived to an old age. The Socrates, does it sound like a success? That he thinks it's a success? No, no. No. Yeah, and Socrates also, remember, he could have lived to an older age. We saw in the Apology, if he were willing to stop philosophizing, he perhaps could have lived to an older age, but he didn't consider that any great prize. So uh, anything to add here before we go on, but I, otherwise we'll just go on to the next section because this, what we ended with here is going to continue. The story is sort of cut off in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the first two paragraphs, the first one was, um, will you find a sure proof of evil that we have good judges and physicians? But then he goes on to say, there's even worse than that. Mm. Um, what was the even worse thing? Uh, he says here that the most shameful thing in the world, or is it still more shameful when a man not only wears out the better part of his days in the courts of law as a defendant or accuser, but from the lack of all true sense of values is led to plume himself on this very thing 
as being a smart fellow to put over an unjust act and cunningly to try every dodge and practice, every evasion, and wriggle out of every hold in defeating justice, and that too for trifles and worthless things. Right. So the first problem was if we have judges and doctors, that means we're getting justice from others and not ourselves. We need a judge to, to organize our actions. We need a doctor to organize our body. And that's bad. But then even worse is somebody in that system who tries to um, manipulate it for their advantage in a corrupt way to, to, to get one over on others, to get more than mm -hmm. their fair share and, and not be corrected. Mm -hmm. That makes right. sense. And they plume themselves. They feel self-satisfied. Are they proud of themselves, how clever they are? Right. The famous line, um, of course I pay less taxes. That means I'm clever. Um, that pe rich people often use. Um, and then that goes even further into someone who mixes medicine and science and then creates a whole bunch of names of illnesses. Mm -hmm. What is that supposed to mean? Because we have uh, um, thousands and thousands of names of different illnesses, both of the body and of the soul, mm -hmm. uh, currently. Mm -hmm. But why is that monstrous? Oh, these are, well, I'm not going to say anything at this point, but these are good questions to hold on to as we look at a better, get a better sense of what gymnastics is. And then we'll see how the more conventional view to dealing with the body and the mind, how it's being, why it's being discussed in this way here. Right. So the, the, the main thing was he's a hypochondriac, every little illness and, um, uh, did they say like petty quabble or something? Um, he got words, but the ending here. Um, he struggled against death, or was it at the bottom? I'm not sure where you were reading from. Um, he was living in perpetual observance of his malady, which was incurable. So he was he was not able to affect a cure, but instead he lived through his days unfit for the business of life. Suffering the tortures of the damned if he departed a whit from his fixed regimen. Right. Struggled against death by reason of his science. He won the prize of a doting old age. So he should have let himself die. That's the implication. But we'll see in the next section as he goes on. So he goes on here also to talk about then working class people has no leisure to be sick and doctor himself. And this we absurdly enough perceive in the case of a craftsman, but we don't see it in the case of the rich and the so-called fortunate. And so that we're going to go on from there to see what he means. Yeah, because on the surface, that sounds horrible. Like, get in the damn mines, and if you get in black lung, then just keep working until you die, and, and don't bother going to the doctor or needing a health care plan or anything like that. Um, just the American medical system. If you don't have insurance, you go back to work. Exactly. Ah, America is a just system. Yes, we are Socratic. There you go. And what was the significance of the cheese in the wine? Oh, I don't. Oh, oh, yeah. I think maybe you're talking back here that there was um, uh, maybe a, a kind of um drink like a medical drink of sorts and it sounded like he was saying that um the damsel gave uh half halfway through 273 yeah um yeah, the she gave damsel the person this drink that was inflammatory and uh, so. so why did she give it to him if it was inflammatory well they didn't have a comprehensive medical system mm -hmm. But that, that's the ideal. <laughs> oh, here, actually, he was saying here that um, there was nothing of that kind in the days of Asclepius. They didn't have all these, you know, fancy names of diseases. And so they gave the person this inflammatory drink. 
again, I think with the idea that it's um, okay if he died, if his injuries were incurable, but let him, you know, maybe go out with a tasty drink. I don't know. <laughs> right. So the medicine was like the worst thing for his condition, but maybe it's tasty or mm. like, I wonder if it's... um. Yeah, they did yeah. treat him the same way that Herodicus treated himself. No, that was, is that, 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 mm-hmm. is that rubbing salt in in the wound? Like, um, I remember I played football once with this crazy Irish uh, doctor, and I like hurt my knee, and I was on the ground, and he came over and he said, "Does this hurt?" And he just kept messing with my knee, um, to like. The word, like, he thought it was funny, and he obviously, you know, realized it wasn't a big deal. But is it that sort of thing? Oh, you're ill. Here's something more inflammatory just to mess with you. Or is it more of that that uh, uh, Buddhist story of the man hanging precariously from the branch of the cliff, and above him are people with swords trying to kill him, and below is a tiger trying to eat him, and he notices the branch is starting to break, but then he also notices a sweet cherry on the branch and he eats it and it's the most delicious thing. And that's the end of the story. Is it that kind of idea? Like if you're going to go anyway, have some lovely wine and enjoy some cheese in it for some reason. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like a good way to go as any. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so going then back to the end here, we see that they talk about the craftsmen. They know it in the case of the craftsmen that they shouldn't prolong their lives in this way that Herodicus did. But it's not known in the case of the rich and the so-called fortunate. Okay, and how so? A carpenter, when he is sick, expects his physician to give him a drug which will operate as an emetic on the disease or to get rid of it by purging or the use of pottery or the knife but if anyone prescribes for him a long course of treatment with swathings about the head and their accompaniments he hastily says that he has no leisure to be sick and that such a life of preoccupation with his illness and neglect of the work which lies before him, isn't worth living. And thereupon he bids farewell to that kind of physician, enters upon his customary way of life, regains his health, and lives attending to his affairs. Or, if his body is not equal to the strain, he dies and is freed from all his troubles. For such a man, that appears to be the right use of medicine. And is not the reason that he had a task and that life wasn't worth acceptance on condition of not doing his work? Obviously. But the rich man, we say, has no such appointed task the necessity of abstaining from which renders life intolerable. I haven't heard of any. Why haven't you heard that saying of Phoclides that after a man has made his pile, he ought to practice virtue? Before two, I fancy. Let us not quarrel with him on that point, but inform ourselves whether this virtue is something for the rich man to practice, and life is intolerable if he does not, or whether we are to suppose that while voluntarianism, typochondrianism from before, is a hindrance to... Sh- Two, single-mindedly attention to carpentry and the other arts. It is no obstacle to the fulfillment of Philoclides' exhortation. Yes, indeed. This excessive care for the body that goes beyond simple gymnastics is about the greatest of all obstacles. 
for it is troublesome in household affairs and military service and sedentary offices in the city. And chief of all, it puts difficulties in the way of any kind of instruction, thinking, or private meditation, forever imagining headaches and dizziness and attributing their origin to philosophy, so that wherever this kind of virtue is practiced, and tested, it is in every way a, a hindrance, for it makes the man always fancy himself sick and never cease from anguishing about his body. Naturally. Then shall we not say that it was because Asclepius knew this, that for those who were by nature and course of life sound of body, but had some localized disease, that for such, I say, and for this habit he revealed the art of medicine, and driving out their disease by drugs and surgery, prescribed for them their customary regimen in order not to interfere with their civic duties but that when bodies were diseased inwardly and throughout, he did not attempt by diet and by gradual evacuations and infusions to prolong a wretched existence for the man and have him beget in all likelihood similar wretched offspring. But if a man was incapable of living in the established round and order of life, he did not think it worth while to treat him since such a fellow is of no use either to himself or to the state. A most politic Asclepius you're telling us of. Obviously, that was his character, and his sons too. Don't you see that at Troy they approved themselves good fighting men? and practiced medicine as I described it? Don't you remember that in the case of Menel Menelaus too, from the wound that Pandar Pandarus inflicted, quote, they sucked the blood and soothing simples sparkled, end quote. But what he was to eat or drink thereafter, they no more prescribed than for Euripleus, taking it for granted that the remedies sufficed to heal men who, before their wounds, were healthy and temperate in diet, even if they did happen for the nonce to drink a posset. But they thought that the life of a man constitutionally sickly and intemperate was of no use to himself or others, and that the art of medicine should not be for such, nor should they be given treatment even if they were richer than Midas. Very ingenious fellows you make out these sons of Asclepius to be. Okay, so obviously on the surface, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But maybe we can start to pull out a few things that give us some idea of what Plato is really referring to, and what Socrates here is really referring to when he talks about gymnastics. At the bottom of page 277, they brought in the idea of the greatest of all obstacles. What hints does that give us about the real problem with this approach to medicine? Is it the excessive care for the body mm -hmm. is the greatest obstacle? Mm. Right, he talks about... Um, it puts difficulties in the way of any kind of instruction or thinking or private meditation. 
So always focused on the body, which means you're not focused on what is more meaningful. And what is that? The soul. The soul. Yes. Um, always you have dizziness and attributing their origin to philosophy. So here he's telling us that we don't want that the proper gymnastic, whatever that is, when remember the word gymnastic is not what we imagine gymnastic to be, but whatever he means by it, it doesn't put our focus on the body, which means that it's not the physical activity that we're thinking of, but it must have some sort of somewhat physical aspect to it or something about it that we can kind of compare to our idea of gymnastics or exercise. So doing something with the body, but not focusing on the body. And this would somehow work along with states of mind, with the study of states of mind. And we see also this idea that one thing that has been, he's been hounding throughout all of this that is so strange to us is this idea that we don't want medicine that, if you have like a quick, um, like he says in the beginning here, something quick that will fix your problem, that's fine. But you don't want to have some sort of regimen that you have to keep up for the rest of your life to constantly maintain the body, to be constantly focused on the body. We want to turn our focus away from the body. And so whatever this gymnastic is it's going to aid that whole study of music and states of mind and turning our attention away from the body to the soul and somehow aiding our study of states of mind and that focus on the healthy condition of the soul that we called music. Any piece that, pieces together? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, that um, quick immediate thing, that's okay. Is that what is meant by the expression, uh, happen for the nonce to drink a posset? Mm, yes. Yeah. 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 If you can just take something quickly that will just kind of fix you, that's great. And maybe that also refers back to the, the posset in the last section, the drink. That if it works... That's great. If not, then maybe you at least enjoy it like that cherry on the tree. And a nonce? Is a nonce a good thing or a bad thing? I think that was the... the wait, I think I may have looked that word up. Because that seems like British English. For this occasion. It's just temporarily present or immediate purpose or occasion. Happen for the nonce to drink a posset. At the moment. Posset is a kind of drink that's like a medicinal drink. Mm. Of the moment to drink a posset. Because you can, because it's a quick remedy. Otherwise, right. you know, just die with your black lung. <laughs> mm. There you go. Yeah, so we're maybe we're starting to sort of, it's sort of coming into focus of what he's talking about here, but it's still not quite clear. Um, do you have any ideas in mind yet? I know you've read this before, Jed, so I won't ask you, but I wonder if Jacob has any ideas yet of what sort of activities might fall under Plato's idea of gymnastics? I don't know, I'm thinking like, you know, like dialogos or something like that, like talking about philosophy with other mm -hmm. people or, you know, uh, <laughs> something like that. Mm. Okay, well, we'll hold on to that as a possibility, but we're going to keep our eyes out to see what he means. What is this activity, whatever he it is, that um, somehow uses the body but brings the attention to the soul because we want to turn away from the body? I think we got a, a nice clue where he said um, at the bottom of 277, 
and the top of the next page, he gave us a lovely triad. Mm-hmm. And I think triads are often clues. Um, uh, chief, uh, the difficulties will get in the way of uh, instruction, mm-hmm. thinking, and private meditation. The thinking seems to be what you're doing. The instruction seems to be the how you're doing it. And private meditation seems to be the why or the goal. So there's a nice what, how, and why triad happening there. Okay. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And and we see that um, however these three are related, they are good things. Right. We want it's some sort of instruction that we want. It's the right kind of thinking and meditation. Right. T- turning it inward, really being focused. Yeah, that's the why. That's what we're, we're aiming for. Yes, yes, right. That's a very good clue there, that we want to be focused. Okay, let's try another section, see if this helps open it up anymore. And so this is at the bottom of uh, 281, section 16. Is fitting, and yet in disregard of our principles, the tragedians uh, and Pindar affirm that Asclepius, though he was the son of Apollo, was bribed by gold to heal a man already at the point of death, and that for this cause he was struck by the lightning. But we, in accordance with the aforesaid principles, refuse to believe both statements. But if he was the son of a god, he was not avaricious. We will insist that if he was greedy of gain, he was not the son of a god. That much is most certainly true. But what have you to say? To this, Socrates, must we not have good physicians in our city? And they would be the most likely to be good, who had treated the greatest number of healthy and diseased men. And so good judges would be those who had associated with all sorts and conditions of men. Most assuredly, I want them good. But do you know whom I regard as such? I'll know if you tell. Well, I will try. You, you, however, have put unlike cases in one question. How so? Physicians, it is true would prove most skilled if, from childhood up, in addition to learning the principles of the art, they had familiarized themselves with the greatest possible number of the most sickly bodies, and if they themselves had suffered all diseases and were not a very healthy constitution. For, you see, they do not treat the body by the body. If they did, it would not be allowable for their bodies to be or to have been in evil condition, but they treat the body with the mind, and it is not competent for a mind that is or has been evil to treat anything well. Right. But a judge, mark you, my friend, rules soul with soul, and it is not allowable for a soul to have been bred from youth up among evil souls and to have grown familiar with them and itself to have run the gauntlet of every kind of wrongdoing and injustice so as quickly to infer from itself the misdeeds of others as it might diseases in the body. But it must have been in inexperienced in evil natures and uncontaminated by them while young, if it is to be truly fair and good and judge soundly of justice, for which cause the better sort seem to be simple-minded in youth and are easily deceived by the wicked, 
since they do not have within themselves patterns answering to the affections of the bad. That is, indeed, their experience. Therefore, it is that the good judge must not be a youth, but an old man, a late learner of the nature of injustice, one who has not become aware of it as a property in his own soul, but one who has through the long years, trained himself to understand it as an alien thing in alien souls, and to discern how great an evil it is by the instrument of mere knowledge, and not by experience of his own. That, at any rate, appears to be the noblest kind of judge. And what is more, a good one, which was the gist of your question. For he who has a good soul is good, but that cunning fellow quick to suspect evil, and who has himself done many unjust acts, and who thinks himself a smart trickster, when he associates with his like, does appear to be clever. Being on his guard and fixing his eyes on the patterns within himself. But when the time comes for him to mingle with the good and his elders, then on the contrary he appears stupid. He is unseasonably distrustful, and he cannot recognize a sound character because he has no such pattern in himself. But since he more often meets with the bad than the good, he seems to himself and to others to be rather wise than foolish. That is quite true. Okay, so going back here, we're again still working with the doctor and with the judge. And we may not be entirely clear what they are, but we see that um, the doctor treats the body with the mind. Whereas the judge rules soul with soul. And so we saw at the end here that the good judge is someone who does not have these evil patterns in themselves. And we can see that when we're judging ourselves, um, we saw with music that the better, the clearer we are in understanding our, the healthier our own state of mind is. If we have the right patterns to start with, remember we saw that the beliefs were at the base in music, that the beliefs were at the base and then the attitudes and behavior and so on come after that. They build on that. And the healthier those patterns are, the better we understand our own state of mind. We can see that same idea here, that to judge, you have to have the healthy patterns in the soul. And the healthier your own patterns, the clearer you're going to be in understanding what is truly good. Right? The person with only unhealthy patterns is not going to know what is truly good. They're not going to recognize it. And the person with only healthy patterns may have some difficulty understanding um, understanding the unhealthy patterns because they've never been associated with them. He says at the top of the page here that the good judge must not be a youth but an old man and a late learner of the nature of injustice. So you should know those patterns. We saw that also in music, the idea that you should know both the positive and negative, but have only the positive at the base of your, as, at the foundation right, of your beliefs, but to know both. And that same idea is here as well. I think this parallels that nicely. The idea that you should know both patterns. And so I think we're getting a better idea of what a judge is because we can see at least the judge within ourselves, right? Um, that those voices in our head that we keep arguing with, they're not good judges, right? They're bad judges. And we want to get rid of them. And we want the healthier judges, right? The healthier voices in our head. 
or get rid of them altogether. If you're going to imitate, it should be only the healthy patterns we saw in music. Right? To the degree that you have any imitation, it should be healthy voices. We want the voice of the daimo, not the voice of mom or dad yelling at us when we were kids. Uh, going back then to the doctor, though, they treat the body with the mind. And if we are our own doctor, if we, we look at ourselves as a judge to understand what the judge is, what if we're our own doctor and we treat ourselves through gymnastics? We're treating the body with the mind. We're treating the mind with the body, maybe more accurate. So giving us some sense also of what medicine is. Um, what are your thoughts, though, as you went through this? What came to you before I say any more? It's still you know, not I, clear. Okay. Yeah, it's not very clear still. I'm glad he explained the analogy from mm. before with the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we said it seems odd that he's denouncing the physicians and mm. judges being mm -hmm. you know, in, in the society and mm. that he broke down what makes a good judge mm -hmm. at this point. So, mm. mm hmm. Yeah, he gave us the good judge. We're still maybe not clear on what he means by the doctor, but it's we have a better sense maybe of a judge, and we can see why we don't want an outside judge. Right? There was the a few sections back. He talked about the judge imported from outside, or a nodding juryman, like you have to convince other people in order to feel good about yourself or to feel good about your beliefs. You don't need that judgment from outside if you have a healthy judge in your own soul. Okay, I think. Yeah, yeah can. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, please. Oh, can I add what I saw? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I like, well, he, I like that he addressed a common phrase that. I hear, well, we hear in our society a lot. You can't judge how I raise my children unless you've raised children yourself. You have to experience it first before you can judge. Therefore, I'm free of judgment. Um, and he goes on to say, well, a doctor doesn't cure cancer because he's had cancer. He uses the soul to judge the body. And that's very important because a lot of people use that expression. You can't judge my Mormonism unless you've lived the Mormon life. Or you can't judge Christianity unless you've lived as an evangelist like I have, which is impossible to live all those sorts of things. Or you can't judge uh, what it's like to have ADHD unless you've got it yourself. There's a common thing thrown out at us, but he's saying, no, you don't judge the negative patterns by living it in your body, you use the soul. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's a good mm -hmm. right. right. That you have to be. And also that's the same idea also that um, sometimes people don't want advice from a person who's not suffering through the same drama. Like if they're caught up in some sort of drama, whether it's like a romantic situation or financial situation or whatever it is. Some people just seem to be a magnet for drama. And they tell somebody who is not in that drama, um, you can't judge, you don't understand it. But if you're stuck in the problem, it means you don't see the way out. Which means that the person, another person who's stuck in it might be able to sympathize with you because you're both stuck. But it's the person who's out of it who's able to say, I can see more clearly the the whole situation and why you're stuck. Right. The difference between sympathy and empathy. Someone explained it. I mean, people use those words differently, but if we were to nail it down, people would say sympathy is you walk by and you see someone in a hole and you jump down in the hole with them. Mm. That 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 feeling of connection through feeling similar, sympathy similar. Whereas empathy, 
you you see someone down in a hole and you ask them how you're going to get out or you throw down a ladder. It's the idea of uh, connection through understanding and not through feeling similar. And a lot of conflicts and, and the person who's a magnet for drama, often that's because they don't see the role of understanding in the soul. So the only way of connection is if I, if I feel bad, I'm going to attack you or yell at you. So you also feel bad. So now we get each other. You feel the same. Of course, it's not actually the same. It's similar. So that feeling of similarity compared to the difference of the doctor, understanding. So it's that role of understanding with the desire, love or care, care with understanding, empathy, compared to just feeling similar sympathy. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you know, maybe the idea of lashing out at others is bringing in something beyond what we're doing here. But certainly the idea that you want to connect with people who are in the same sort of drama or who get stuck in the same sort of problems. That I think we can see here in the text. Right. And also um, taking it up one level from that to uh, learning, um, I, what he's describing here is my experience of learning philosophy at college. Um, he said, your first part of your life, you're only dealing with the true pattern, the healthy pattern with healthy people, because you need to get that into yourself first. You don't want to have all the associations. And then once you have that in your soul, then you can spend some time learning the distortions, learning the variations of that pattern, learning how that pattern breaks down. First, getting the 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 pig city, the good city. We love pig city, and then learning about the uh, unhealthy um, city, the 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 state in high fever. And I would have loved this book at college because they did it backwards. They threw us all of the unhealthy or the various different kinds of philosophies. Here's Kant with his craziness here's Nietzsche with his nihilism nonsense here's Hegel with his material like and I didn't know what to do with them all what I would have loved and what I think we're getting here is first here is the true pattern here the spend the first years of college learning the true pattern learning the actual philosophy the healthy soul what is the the right way of thinking um, being instructed and meditating. And then after you've got that, then you have uh, somewhere to place all of the other many different sicknesses and variations. You've got, you've got the coat hanger and now you can hang the different coats of the other people. Mm -hmm. That would have been the best thing, which is why you have to be an old judge because you spend the time with the good. And then, whereas at college, they just threw all the bad at you. In fact, I don't think anyone there actually thought there was such a thing as a good pattern. You just take your pick at whatever of the many different variations. Yeah, right. What we learn in university is relativism. You just find the one you like. And there isn't a exactly. right one. There isn't a right pattern to hang all the others on. Right. And that was one of my key confusions and, of course, turned it inward, like you said, that parental voice. When I am suffering, um, I, I mm -hmm. turn that negative voice inward and I, my confusion was met with disappointment and self-blame. I didn't know why I couldn't make sense of anything that was happening at college but this simple paragraph, uh, what is it, uh, 16 here, um, lays it out. Of course it wasn't making any sense. I didn't, they were just throwing things at me and I didn't know how to make sense of them. I couldn't order them. I couldn't see the meaning in them because, or, and all I would have needed for it to be a completely different experience and one that I could use in my own life and therefore meaningful which was lacking, mm -hmm. all I would have needed is first, let's get the true pattern down, spend time with the true model, and then we can go and learn mm. Hegel and Kant and all these other crazy men. Yeah, ironically, that's kind of the way I learned it, because I took a philosophy 101 class when I was like a freshman or sophomore, I forget, but I, I didn't really get it. I didn't really enjoy it. 
um, at that time I didn't understand. And I learned, and they talk about Plato in a way that doesn't make sense the way um, the way we've been doing it here. But at that time, I thought I don't understand why anyone reads Plato, and I don't understand why anyone reads Aristotle. He's so boring, and all these other philosophers. There's so many things wrong. You can just see that there are many things that just don't fit right, and I wasn't really into it. Um, and then years later, I discovered Plato in a very different context and in a way that was like meaningful to my life. That I came to it at a time when it was addressing the actual um, crossroads that I was at in my life. And um, so then I got into Plato and not as a not as a philosophy student, like a university student studying the smorgasbord of philosophers, just studying Plato. And so now when I'm introduced to ideas from other philosophers, I have this basis that I can, this is like the code rack that they all hang on, right? This year, first laying it out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the two parts. Because it's the true order, you can use it and it becomes meaningful to address the difficulties and the goals in your life. That's the first thing. And the second thing is without first establishing the true pattern and the true healthy soul, it would be akin to doing medicine and someone throwing cancer at you, but never telling you that it's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Cancer. Here's cancer. Well, what is it? Uh, Without the model of the healthy body, you can't see where it, where it's a variation or judge that it's unhealthy. So it's like, here's cancer, here's tuberculosis, while making no distinctions between that and a true healthy body. It's insanity. But with the healthy model, not only can we um, recognize variations from the healthy model, ph- philosophical cancer, you could say, but... The better we understand it, we can understand why it's wrong. Where did he fall down? Where is the variation from the model? Mm, So it it seems insane to throw all these illnesses and not be able to distinguish why they're wrong or even that they're wrong. Mm. And without the um, using it in your own um, self, the purpose, which is our triad again. Right. And then just asking young philosophy students, who have no, we don't have any such pattern to say, oh yeah, just read all of these and figure out for yourself which one you think is best. Eh. Crazy. Mm. A city of high fever. Mm. (laughs) Jacob, you came to philosophy a bit later too. Um, Anything from your experience you can add to the conversation? Uh, (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I've only came to philosophy in like the last year or so and Mm -hmm. i'm starting with plato so Mm -hmm. or so it's nice i guess right right gotta start ancient Mm -hmm. i i I guess like there's a philosopher like alfred north whitehead he said some quote about philosophy has been a series of footnotes to Mm -hmm. plato and uh yeah i figured someone says something like that might as well start Start there. Mm. Move yeah. down. And there must have been something when you first started looking into Plato, there must have been something that grabbed you that felt meaningful. It like a lot of philosophy is just about like it's fun to think about these questions. But with Plato, there's something that really touches you. That this is meaningful to my life. Do you remember? I don't mean to put you on the spot yeah. here, but no, no, no. Like I think that I remember because I was in a point in my life where I just kind of felt mm-hmm. not like anything was mattering. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh we I listened to some talk about reincarnation mm-hmm. and it was in the context of someone who who knew about a lot about Plato. And I remember when I was a kid uh thinking just like one day when I was at, I was in elementary school, I was, I know I was like walking back from like the, like basketball court, like mm-hmm. area, it might've been like after lunch. And I mm-hmm. thought I was thinking about like death and I was thinking, well, reincarnation just makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like the right 
way it has to be if in order for like justice to exist and you know people mm-hmm. seem to get away with stuff if, if it was mm-hmm. just this life mm-hmm. and i thought that was really young i never really thought about it again i was like atheist because that was what was cool and then mm-hmm. i heard that and then i listened to the fado and was uh like wow this is really clicking made me think about that old ev- event and then mm-hmm. yeah been been hooked since so mm, interesting yeah yeah okay i think that um we only have a few minutes left and the next section is i think going to finally start to open up what gymnastics really is so we got a few little hints throughout the sections that we looked at today but we have a lot of question marks and then I hope that next week, actually, there's just a few more sections. I think there's just two more sections left to wrap up gymnastics. And so I think that um, a little bit of review of uh, what we did today and then going into those two sections, we should be able to get a very good sense of what gymnastics is and how it fits together with music, because we're going to see that these two work together. We saw a little bit of that, that it's akin to music. We saw in the first section that we read on gymnastics. So we've got all these little question marks, all these little mysteries. And we will hopefully then um, put it all together next time. So thank you both. And thank you for the conversation. Those of your past and coming to how you came to Plato. Very interesting. And I think everyone has an interesting story like that because there is something about Plato that is just, it rings true. It's not just interesting things to think about, you know, catnip for the brain. It's, it's something, it's something more. And um, i and only philosophers in this tradition, at least I've found really speak to me that way. And uh, yeah, it's just a really fascinating thing. And I agree with you, Jed, that this is the basis that all the other philosophers hang on. And this is why everything else is a footnote to Plato, because this is the foundation that they're all commenting on. And they're either right or wrong based on whether or not they agree with Plato. That's basically what it comes down to. Mm. Um, Those of you watching on YouTube, if you do have any questions or comments, anything you want to add to the conversation, please put that in the comments section. And I do hope that you will join us next week as we continue on and figure out what the heck gymnastics is. So thank you very much.